Welcome to another edition of Top Lines and Tales. This week we're sponsored by Harbro, manufacturers and suppliers of quality livestock nutrition. Welcome back to the second instalment of the History of Hereford Cattle. Joined again this week by Clive Davis and another guest this time, uh, Boomer Birch. Welcome, chaps. Hi, Andy. Good to hear you. Clive, let's pick up where we left off uh, with a bull we were talking about called Tarrington Optimist. And Born in 1928, he was possibly the most important Hereford bull of all time, would that be fair? And, and where would he leave his stamp in those early days, Clive? Yeah, he, he would have been. I, he didn't underscript for a bull. He, won, he managed to win his junior class at the um, 1929 Royal. Um, but then Harry started using him, and what he was developing was some specific line breeding programs, which bred a string of sires, you know. And they always said that uh, you could go to a Hereford bull sale and if he had four or five bulls there, if you missed the one, you could have the next and it wouldn't matter, you know. And, and that was the sort of stamp that uh, was put on, which Optimus started. I I just come across a very old Hereford sale catalogue from the 1950s this week. And like if you open it at any page, there's six bulls on set out on a double page sort of thing. And... More often than not, four of them would go straight back to this sort of breeding. So, and that was by 1950, you know, so that was just like 20, 25 years on. And and it happened that quickly, really. So by the 60s, every tail male line went back to Optimist and uh, that remained the case up until the mid-late 70s. Mm, certainly, he can't, he can't be underestimated, can he, in, uh, in Hereford breeding circles. And we talked briefly last week about the growing export markets, Clive, and uh, especially where grazing cattle were needed, like the plains of the Midwest and the South America, of course. And this not only put a bottom in the UK market, but it dramatically drove up the home trade, really, didn't it? And bringing in new breeders, because uh, there, there was some money to be had. Yes, well, indeed, and, and of course it did. It attracted some big money. You, you see, I think the difference between the Hereford breed and um, the, 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 the Shorthorns and the Angus has been that it hasn't had the real highlights as far as um, trade goes. I mean, you know, back in the 50s, Angus bulls were making, you know, fifteen to 20,000 very regularly. Well, that's never, ever happened with the Hereford because the highest price still at a official society sale is twelve and a half thousand in nineteen forty six by a bull called Western Masterpiece, who who interestingly was a different line to the Optimist line, but it, it eventually uh, sort of died out. And it was the Elia family who were based at Grimsby. They were uh, operated trawlers and okay. um, you know, quite a wealthy family. And actually three or four branches of the family got involved with Error for breeding. Uh, and that was the sort of people that were brought in and they had the money to spend and um, you know but the Hereford breed has never really hit the heights that um, many of the other popular breeds have. It's an interesting you say that I've been researching, obviously, the Shorthorn and the Angus for this uh, this series. And there is, it does attract some wealthy people who can buy their way into the breed and uh, and then they can sell two or three at a decent price and, and get a headline or two. But they're not in it for the long haul and maybe a lot of them aren't really proper cattle breeders. But if it brings those people in, as again, more recently as we'll go on to, the, it brings a demand for females and that obviously keeps the job buoyant, doesn't it? That's the point, Andy, and I'm afraid they come and they go. And, um, I mean, we see that in all forms of stock breeding. But um, whilst they're, they're, they're very important, and, and they'll offer genetics, and the genetics will move on to somebody else, so it's all very valuable. That's what we've witnessed, uh, you know, jump into more modern times. I mean, the, sort of since 2000, our Hereford breeding female trade has, has, has expanded tremendously. I mean, the, you know, the average for sales is, well above most other breeds and um, and it's great to see younger people like Boomer and Millie coming along and getting stuck in and involved because uh, that's where um, the future is and they've got the energy to see it through and um, and the expertise that they bring with it is is good to mix in as well so uh, I think always the Hereford female has been of great value whether it's just as a commercial value which is the reason the breed exists or indeed as a as a pedigree market for uh, future breeders to work with. 
you talk about uh, the energy of Boomer there. We'll leave him sleep for a few more minutes and then we'll bring him in to, uh, to counter that. He's probably got more energy than you and I put together, Clive. But <laughs> before we get to that, I just want to sort of continue on that vein. And of course, a lot of these export buyers would come over and they'd go to the shows wouldn't they? and the shows were super important I don't think they are quite so much today but they were super important back then we hadn't got social media or even photographs to back these animals up so they'd rock up at the royal show and uh, if you were winning the sections in the royal show then you were, you were right in front of the shop window for them weren't you and well, I would say which of these herds would be predominantly sought after by these export buyers back back then Clive? Well, um, on a previous uh, podcast, I knew we spoke about uh, Percy Bradstock winning the championship with, with a bull that he bought in and then selling him at a great value uh, for export, which resulted in him able to buy a farm. You know, well, well that, that's, that was in 1919. That's a fair indication of the importance of uh, sure. getting out and uh, publicising what you're about. And, of course, the Royal Show was the event. And, and, and the fact that people would travel the length and breadth of well, England, if you like, but as we discussed, uh, some royal sh- uh, English royals were held in Wales. But um, the, the fact that people would travel that distance with their stock in those days, which couldn't have been easy. And, and then the whole event was geared up for that promotion because um, the way people exchange views as you point out Andy we didn't have social media back in the 1930s but we did have the telegram system and messages would be flying around backwards and forwards and then you had the great exporters people like um, um, Jimmy Schofield uh, to name just one who would be operating particularly with South America and he'd be advising I expect some of his clients in South America that this great bull had just won this class and of course he was involved with all the breeds mm. and, and exporting them all um, and uh, that's how it was operating then and it was very busy trade mm. very busy certainly as I said it would put an emphasis on to to, to win those shows or even to be at those shows and, and, and back then that would showing would be a, a slightly more profitable business as well and the likes obviously of the Vern and the haven and, and these people as well would be in the limelight and uh, people would go straight to straight to their pens as soon as they got there wouldn't they exactly and and of course we discussed captain de quincey and his ability to sell like i mean he he managed to sell bulls 10 times for what he wanted for him which was quite remarkable but uh, all, all of them would have been jumping on on this sort of bandwagon and um you mention of the lewis's of avon i think over the time they've probably built up the strongest export trade of any livestock breeders over their history and uh, still continuing today. But, uh, I mean, this was, this was the importance of the uh, genetics moving around the world. Uh, of course, more recently, we've seen it coming back to us, but uh, um, that's a good job that they went out there in the first place. Sure. And, and we talk about uh, earlier exports. Mm-hmm. I mentioned to me a bull back in the 1800s called Anxiety, uh, Clive, who, who won his share of shows in the US. And again, another bull that's probably very important that we shouldn't leave out. No, well, whilst we talk about Tarrington Optimist and how all UK male tail lines had got back to him by the 60s, certainly by the 1970s. The same thing happened in America with this bull called Anxiety, who was called that because Mr. Carwardine, Thomas Carwardine from Stockton, Brenier, Lemster, bred him and was anxious about him because he got sort of bent front legs, which is unknown whether it was um, caused during his calving or a deformity, but whatever, the ball managed to grow out. He won two first prizes at consecutive royal shows, but then was exported to America. But whilst he went over that and was certainly the talk of the place and won championships at the state fairs at about five, I think, um, a, a son was born at Stockton Bree. And they followed this line of naming, and this one particular one was called Anxiety the Fourth. Now, he he wouldn't have been the most attractive because he was um, what we call yellow, a bit pale in colour. Um, but Thomas Carradine had been asked by two a partnership of breeders in America, Gudgel and Simpson, they were known as, and they operated a, a major cattle breeding out. What they envisaged was cattle with much more shape than they'd seen and 
particularly in the Herefords, to compete with the short ones, because we're all aware the short ones can offer some shape. Um, the, the advantage the Hereford got, they were better range cattle, uh, you know, better at consuming grass and putting flesh on accordingly, whether some short ones perhaps needed a bit more um, additional feed. And so they, they envisaged breeding a Hereford to, to match up with the short ones. So they needed this extra shape, this extra muscle, as we'll call it nowadays. Um, and Mr. Carvadine, he got the telegram going and, got, and sent them the message that this calf had been born and he was the one. Well, they were a little bit dubious about him because he was a three-quarter brother mated to a three-quarter sister. And he came from a line that had got bad front legs. That to me sounds sounds dangerous. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's it. Exactly, Andy. And and it would it wouldn't add up. But anyway, the bull went before he was a year old. I think they paid about four hundred dollars for him, and he absolutely re- revolutionised Hereford cattle breeding. And within about forty or fifty years, every male tail line of American Herefords went back to Anxiety the Fourth. But it's only part of the story because on one of the same buying missions, Gudgell and Simpson also bought many females, probably a couple of hundred over, say, three years. And one of them was a cow called Dowager the Sixth that came from Thomas Lewis's herd, who was at the Woodhouse at Shobden, which is still a very well-known name in stock breeding with the current Owens family. But... This cow wouldn't have been the pick of them, certainly not for the show ring. But it was found when she was mated to Anxiety the Fourth that the progeny were quite exceptional. And three of them definitely were because two bulls, one called um, Don Carlos, the other Don Quixo, uh, they were used extensively. Um, and a daughter called Donna produced an- another uh, very uh, high performing bull. But when Gudgell and Simpson started line breeding to this particular line and mixing it in, they eventually bred a bull a couple of years before the herd was dispersed called Prince Domino. Mm -hmm. And he carries seven crosses within about six generations of these two cattle, Anxiety the Fourth and Dowager the Sixth. And on him is the absolute structure of what became the American Hereford industry and he produced numerous sons and now that we've ended up importing North American genetics into the UK our own herd will probably contain genetics representing certainly four or perhaps even five of Prince Domino's sons and everywhere in the world is like that. And of course, he is the. He was also, as we will go on to probably talk about, he was really the backbone of what became the Paul Erreford okay. development because they come from those bloodlines as well. Okay, as you said, really, that the old picture of the world of Erreford's came down to Prince Domino, who was a sort of five generations away from Anxiety the Fourth. A very influential bull himself, certainly. Uh, sounds like uh, globally and. Um... Let's move on a little bit and look at the slowing down of the breed, I suppose. In the late 50s, the sires were starting to get a bit too small for home use, and breeders like the Verne were chasing that South American market and losing their eye a little on the commercial trade uh, back home. Clive, who would take responsibility for that, if you could point the finger? Well, I think it's the same as we've seen ever since, really. And it's fashion, isn't it? Or, or market requirement that goes a bit extreme, probably. And like we definitely saw it repeated here again during the 1990s, when arguably now looking back, the native breeds got too framey for their own good mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and maybe lost their resource and what their part of life was to be. But there's, there's an argument there, Clive, isn't there, that if you do get them big and narrow, at least if you get the size of them, it's easier to breed them back down again. But when you breed them small, it's a lot harder to bring them back up to where they need to be for the commercial man. Yes, well, indeed, and it's pretty well-known fact that in America, and I think it happened with all three of the, the, the great breeds, uh, they developed into dwarfism, which was like, um, well, they called them snorters because they were such small calves with big heads and like their breathing had all gone to pot and they were an absolute disaster, which was 
you know, due to getting the frame too small, but then too much closely bred as well. And um, so that's a lesson to be learned. But that's a lesson we can learn from the Americans is they do do things to extremes, they do everything to extremes, don't they? And uh, I'd like to think that the UK, we had a little bit more sense about us not to take these things right to the very limit like they did, but we still did get, we ended up with a lot of these small bulls and for every small bull, you can have small cows that uh, that are no good to anybody. And that sort of let the door open for... Uh, in, in, as you said, in all the three breeds, left the door open for the, the Continental. But do you think that everybody went down that road or were there some people sort of hanging in there going, hang on, this isn't the right way to go? No, oh no, well, there definitely were. And some of them saw the writing on the wall and started to act. And I think one of the great breeders of modern day, like the last 50 years, UK Arafoods, has been Richard Milner, who was the first to import um, North American horn genetics, mm-hmm. but ironically, he went back to Tarrington Optimus in his bloodlines because he come from um, via Vern Diamond, uh, like so. But he had more frame because he was one of these range cattle from Canada, you know, mm-hmm. and so they had the potential to be able to alter things. Equally, some own bred herds had kept to a, a, a more practical type rather than shade chase in the export and so um you know you can imagine up in some of the welsh hills where there are many hundreds of uh, purebred Hereford herds uh, they they'd kept them pretty sound and, and practical and um what we noticed uh, particularly coming through the 1970s was how the fashion was going to go back from the small compact cattle to ones with more growth and that enabled some herds to come to better prominence sure. and in amongst them will be um, the Bodnam herd of the Wayman Joneses and and, and, and Arvi's uh, very eloquent podcast with you demonstrated how they became a, a very successful herd in the 70s. Um, Freetown had always managed to maintain a little bit more growth in, in their stock. The Lewis family at the Avon were well aware of uh, what was going on because they were operating worldwide. Mm. Uh, fortunately Fortunately for my father, his type of cattle sort of come more into vogue and we went through, a, you know, a very successful phase there. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it wasn't all lost. And as a result, I think we've managed to get back and get those genetics collected up and combine them with some improved genetics that have come from overseas and um, kept the breed going strong. And without throwing the baby out with the bathwater, which is what a lot of the other breeds of the Angus and the Shorthorn probably did and went through that that doldrums. And I remember talking to somebody about De Quincey, and maybe this was in our earlier podcast, that um, he was actually looking to reverse the trend as well. Before he died, he certainly was trying to buy back stronger native genetics rather than going overseas to get the stuff that he didn't particularly agree with. I've covered this in, in other breeds as well, and some of them looked to Ireland. There was a lot of good stock left in Ireland, in the uh, Angus breeds, certainly, that people looked to pick up. Yeah, well, it definitely was, and and I think you're right. I think they probably just kept a little bit away from the, you know, they 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 weren't totally in vogue in the in in the fifties, sixties. So basically, their cattle had stayed a little bit more practical, and uh, you know, were certainly available to use, and and, and were indeed used. I mean, we had a great benefit from bringing in uh, a, an Irish bred bull, albeit that he also can they contained a lot of North American bloodlines by then, but nevertheless, um, you know, that that was the stamp that was um, set in his ancestry, and um, a good job it was too. Slightly different mindset in Ireland uh, uh, that we do here, and still that still does. Let's move on, or move back in actual fact, because if we go back as far as 1900, uh, a lawyer from Des Moines in Iowa called Warren Gammon started to look at ways of breeding hornless Herefords by studying Darwin's theories. And of course, Darwin was an incredible man that sort of looked at everything and nobody really quite understood where the pole came from in the Angus side. I don't think Darwin worked that one out either. But by studying Darwin, he he set out in motion to find some hornless Herefords that maybe been born by, by mutation, uh, um, Clive. And he did, didn't he? He found them. Yeah, well, he had this vision that a hornless beast would be better, and well, nobody can argue with that. Really, I think that's a fair comment. And and, and then, especially nowadays, and and he, this was in 19, the early 1900s, he was operating. So indeed, but um, um, the way he went about it is he had access to all the Hereford breeders. We're sure about 
two and a half thousand in America, basically wrote to them requesting if they'd noticed that they'd had cattle of horn parentage uh, produce cows with no horns, um, th then he'd like to know about them. And he got a lot of replies from the majority of people. But it all boiled down in the end to, to, to just like a couple of handfuls, really. And um, from that, he bred up um, a, a polled strain of Hereford. Um, I suspect that he, for a couple of generations, he'd use just those bloodlines, then mix them back in with some horn genetics. Um, and that that went on throughout the American pole history, really. In fact, I think when the UK became interested in uh, getting pole Herefords over to this side of the Atlantic, um, an effort was made to ensure that the ones that came carried as much pole gene as possible, um, because clearly they were going to be using them on... Hereford cows that have been bred horned for generations sure, by, they by need, then. So. They'd, they'd need the homozygous in there, wouldn't they? And, and so starting with, as you said, a handful, I think it was eight females. He must have done some serious inbreeding to try and fix that, uh, that homozygous gene in, in the bulls. And then uh, if that would take the horns off, off horned cattle, then uh, the guy did something right. But uh, it would be a dangerous game again. I think he would play. Uh, and, and I'm right in thinking by the 70s, there were a quarter of a million of uh, polled Herefords registered in the US. So uh, they took on pretty fast, didn't they? And, and, uh, got... Very. And I believe Warren Gammon carried on and then his son after him, and they ran the polled Hereford Breed Society in, in the US. Yes, they did, and they, they, so it, it was a family-run thing. Um, but by then, it had become very established, of course, and... Mm. Um, and, and very successful with it. I think it's worth pointing out that um, the sceptics uh, uh, amongst us uh, do wonder whether these cattle were all mutations. Clearly, what Warren Ga Gammon sifted out what he would be sceptical of himself, I'm sure, you know, if he felt that they weren't quite, you know, looking like Erifords or that their colours weren't perhaps, uh, you know, because, cause, I mean, you know, there are pole breeds about that have been around for many generations. I'm mean, sure the Galloway must be one of the longest surviving. Um, the, the the red pole that we know of the eastern counties here of the UK, they'd have all been exported to America and, and they would be around and about. So, um, you know, I think possibly... Um, the, the area that the, the uh, pioneering pole breeders had to crack. You're really. stepping through a political minefield there, Clive, but I'll let you, I'll let you carry on. In fact, I won't let you carry on. I'll bring Boomer in here. And, uh, and Boomer, you're fairly relatively new to the breed uh, con compared to, to Clive, but you've you've majored on the pole side of it, haven't you? And your dad bred Simmentals, and you grew up with white-headed cattle, I suppose, and, and you bred Belgian blue. So when and why, when and why Boomer, did you go into the Hereford breed? Yeah. It's uh, again, like you said, Andy, nowhere near the the knowledge and experience of Clive. But um, I suppose it was it was really we major in blues for and Simitels, for like you say, for for many years. Um, and then uh, I was actually in my final year of university. Uh, I'd just done a placement year at Graham Brindley's, who uh, is of the famous Brindley herd of blues uh, and, and, and Holsteins. Um, I went out to Canada. Uh, I was invited by William Hare um, of the Door Pole Herd. Um, he invited me out to go and uh, be part of a, of a preparation team for the Remontel uh, herd dispersal sale. Um, at this point, I'd never heard of Remontel Cattle Company. Uh, it was a massive Hereford and Angus operation, which saw us disperse over 2,000 head of cattle over uh, a two weekend period 1,000 Angus, 1,000 Herefords. Um, and that was really, I came back from there, and that was the turning point. Of, of really got me into Hereford, I suppose, and the quality of cattle we saw over there. Uh, we came back and said, I said, I said to Graham, you know, you know what, we need to look at maybe getting to Hereford. I can see a future in these. Yeah, okay. And right, and I'm, and I'm thinking that most, a lot of your genetics would have come from that over the water there. Also, uh, um, I'm right in thinking probably most of all, probably the, the poll genetics in the UK came from USA going back to the 50s, and but they would arrive in the UK from Canada. And uh, would you have studied some of that, that, that those early cattle coming in and aware of those early imported semen, uh, um, uh, Boomer? Well, probably not as much as a student and not as much as Clive. I suppose my real, my real understanding was probably over the last decade, I need to be honest with you, in terms of what's happened. My exposure over at Remontel was very much based on, on, on their breeding programme and on, on what they were doing. 
when we got back to this country, it wasn't until then that I probably realised and looking into the breed and I started to take interest. Brem and Tal had a big influence on not only uh, America and Canada, but at the UK market too, with breeders like, you know, um, Steve Edwards at Costorp uh, and Chris is over in Northern Ireland using these, he's at McMordy's of Solpol, mm-hmm. using these Rem and Child genetics within their programme. And certainly, you know, Ivan and, and William in their Dorpol programme too, um, which probably made me realise how lucky I was getting out there and seeing them Rem and Child guys and what they were doing. It wasn't until we got back to realise what an influence they'd had, really. Okay, and uh, Clive, I'll probably just for our listener, we'll try and fill in a little bit of sort of how the the polled um, breed did uh, establish itself over in uh, the UK. And as I said, the, I think the first genetics came into from Canada in the in the forties, and there was one bull calf I think called Colin Arthur, and again a hugely significant animal he was, Clive. Well, he was because that's what got the thing go the project going here. He was actually. Well, it, it, it sounds a very dubious set of circumstances, but I think there was a group of people who'd obviously been talking about establishing uh, the, the North American polar in the UK and just wondering how they could go about doing it. Um, because bear in mind the Erfurt Erd Book Society, as it was known as then, um, wouldn't allow uh, registration from calves by AI, which was in the very early stages of it back then. But mm, nevertheless, I they, could, it, it, they couldn't it, guarantee it, where it came from, and, I suppose, Clive. No, well, it, it took a long time for that rule to be relaxed. So how the heck are we going to get these animals from uh, over the water? Well, um, David Talbot Rice from New Sire and Sester was one of the pioneering um, uh, men involved. And uh, what they actually did was uh, brought some semen from a Circle M ranch, that's um, H.P. Otmore, a very successful um, uh, American breeder of Paul Erfords. And um, they near enough smuggled this semen in to the UK and and started using it on some particular cows. Um, But uh, only one calf resulted, which was this bull calf that was given the name Colin Arthur. And David Talbot Rice took hold of the bull and and started to utilise him. Um, But it was worse than the fact that the Erefer Society wouldn't register cows by AI, which this animal, of course, was, um, because actually his mother neither was fully registered, and it sort of made a right mess of everything from the very outset. But they built up a register of progeny that he he bred, and from it they bred a small nucleus strain of Paul Hereford. I've seen this strain entered into sales in the early 1960s in in old catalogues, and so it did get going, but of course it failed because of all those problems. But what it did, it just lit a spark. And it lit a spark with the government because they'd been approached about how are we going to get these Erefords polled and we need to get these genetics in. Um, and so basically they they allowed ex- import licenses from Paul Erefords from New Zealand, which had obviously originated from North Amer- from America. Um, and that was the first two consignments came for, as live animals from New Zealand. Then about the year after, they allowed in a one-off importation of American stock. Um, and then... Canada and Australia got involved over the next few years. So during the 1950s, I would think there'd be 20 consignments representing nearly 200 cattle. Okay. And and it was they that were the nucleus of the pole era for the, here in the UK. And by now, other people had joined the Talbot Rices, like uh, well-known names like um, Oscar Colburn and his father at Crickley Barrow, and Anthony's still breeding some Erefords down there, so they're very long-established Paul Ereford. Um, the Duke of Grafton at uh, Eastern Estate in, in just in here in Norfolk, they were pioneers. A chap called John Young from Ringstead, who was a a great person to have involved because he was like an agricultural journalist as well as a farmer. So he was spreading the word as much as he could, I'm sure. And and um, also a fellow called Albert 
Cherry Downs, who was based near Newark, and he was involved in the malting trade, got a bit of money behind him. He paid the highest price. I think it was $19,000 for, for a bull. Um, and so we were all getting a good cross-section of genetics, which then, in the main, were used on uh, uh, traditional uh, horned Hereford cows, and they started to build up the numbers and the bloodlines, and eventually it come together. A, a, a group was formed called the Pole Hereford Breeders of Great Britain to sort of promote and to organise all their affairs. And then eventually the whole thing was taken over through Hereford House. Through- Clive, you make it sound very seamless, but it wasn't. Was Hereford Breeders in the UK would be still be very traditional going back the way, and it did split the breed down the middle for a, for a long time and on, on both sides of the water as well, not just... Uh, not just the breed, but the cattle were different, weren't they? I mean, generally the two couldn't compete on the same stage, Clive. The traditional older breeders wouldn't accept of these imports, and uh, so they started the pole breeders, as you said. They had their own society, and they started their own show. And and um, and uh, if if I could be judgmental, maybe the Canadian horn breed would be taller and narrower, especially to start with. And no disrespect to you, uh, Boomer, they've changed. I know, but I remember buying a, a steer from. Steve Edwards, that was a Canadian bred steer, and I showed him in the baby class at Smithfield, pure steer, and uh, he was about twice the size of everything else, in, in, or twice the height, anyway, of all the others in the class, and he came last, and probably rightly, but they really were the different cattle, and it's taken a long time to amalgamate those two, and uh, there'd still be very few people today that would breed both horned and uh, and polled, would I be right? I think, and again, Clive, but in at any point that you think necessary, but I think, in all honesty, Andy, that for me, there is still a big difference. Um, probably looking at art from a from an outsider into the Hereford breed, um, I would say that the, the horn you can still see definite differences between the horned cattle and the polled cattle in the UK. Um, it, the, the gaps getting certainly getting narrower, uh, and the breeding goals are, are are getting similar. What I would say, interestingly, and it's a big um, a boost for the polled genetics. Obviously, we know where. The, the beef industry is going internationally, um, and Pole certainly ticks the boxes for retailers, processors, uh, etc. And um, there's a lot of these uh, traditional horn breeders are sort of looking at Pole genetics now. I would say, I mean, we spoke about the Haven and the Lewis's earlier. These would be one guys that have also set up a, a Pole herd alongside the well-established uh, quality horn herd, and um, to try and input, to try and bring in some Pole genetics. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget one, when we first started sort of 10 years ago, 11 years ago, I saw my first, one of the first I ever died fell in love with was a heifer called uh, French Stone Boo, French Stone One Boo, who was bred by the Air family down in Devon. Um, and she was brought out by Andrew Hughes. Clive, you'll probably remember a while. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was out of a horned cow by a polled bull. Right. Uh, and, and she was the first real, sort of what I'd call a game changer at Hereford, certainly in, mm-hmm. in my era that, that that I saw. Okay, that, let's just step back to the eighties for a minute, just because we sort of, I suppose we skirted over it. But I mean, they were they were tough times. I remember this particular steer. I think in the mid eighties, and I took him to Smithfield, and there were three in the class, and they're probably only eight or ten Herefords there altogether, rather than the hundreds they used to be. And and the the whole Hereford breed had fallen from favour around then, in the same way that the Angus and and the other breeds had. And they they were tough times ahead. But maybe we'll get onto that in a minute. But Back to the polls that I said they were. Back to the polls. I sound like a politician. <laughs> they were. They weren't even rivals, though, were they? They were just said they were. They were different breeds, and uh, they had their own show. The polls did in Morton in the Marsh, and there'd be a couple of hundred head there, maybe. And the, the Horn guys had your own show in in uh, first at Kington, I think, and then at Tembury Wells Clive, which you were very instrumental behind, and I think it's still going, isn't it? And did, would they have had their own herd book? The polls have kept their own herd book for a while before the Hereford Society. Took it all in house. Yeah, they definitely did, and they? I mean, from the start, everything was documented, and that was great, you know. And, and the the parent society took on all the records, and um, you know, carried on, and and yeah, they produce their own registers now, that, you know. And and well, the the breeds can be interbred a bit, but of course, um, if you introduce um, polar for genetics. 
the registration becomes polarified rather than horned, you know. Okay. I think going back to what Boomer said about some uh, today's breeders um, getting polarifids alongside their own genetics if they've already got established herd like that, I think I think it's the market that drives their decision a lot, you know. I, I don't think it's that they look at the animal and say, well, this particular animal is better than that one necessarily. But I mean, if your customers are coming and demanding that they want to look for a particular item, well, you'll do your damnedest to provide it. Sure. And I think I think for a lot of established horn breeders who've probably got some very good genetics in and behind them and the stock are doing fine, if the customer wants a, a, a pole bred bull, well, you better get some, you know. And I think that those breeders are finding that. I mean, I've got friends who breed more than one breed, and mm. invariably, if they get on the phone and say, "Well, come and have an Aberdeen Angus bull off you," yeah, come along and have a look. And they actually go home with one with a white head. Well, you know, the trade's done, and and so I think the trade is driving a lot of this. I, I, my just one concern for the the pole Erifer is just about what Boomer said about that heifer called Boo. I think if you have to mix in some genetics that sort of just take the edge off what it is you're doing, I think we've just got to be a bit wary of that. Because I think if I was buying um, a pole bull to put on my commercial herd of any breed, whatever breed it is, because I mean, obviously, a lot of breeds have got pole sections now, I'd just be pretty pleased if all the calves were polled mm. because... Um, you know, if you get a bit half and half, and a lot of our our suckler cows are on genetics because they're invariably by Charolais and Limousins and Simmons and British Blues and all the other great breeds. I, I, I mean, um, a pole bull is pretty important that it should be able to pole. And with DNA analysis now, I believe that can um, a judge homozygous nature pretty successfully. And I think that's something that it would be well worthwhile looking at. Sure, sure. Good, good wise words, wise words. And Clive, just going back to those early days, I suppose I was harping on about really is that there were some of the breeders, traditional breeders anyway, that did stick to their guns and kept the horned fires burning as it was. And uh, uh, your dad would be one of those. But there were there were quite a few strong characters, both breeders and stockmen back then. And yeah, well, Dad was one of them, but his son probably more so. <laughs> as, far, <laughs> as far as we, what we're doing, Andy, I, I, I wrote like a sort of a, a resume of our history, started it 20 years ago, sadly after Dad went, and that's the problem, because there's lots of questions, obviously, now I'd like to ask of him. But um, nevertheless, I've put together this sort of document, and it's a, a, a live thing that's ongoing. Um, and I, I edit it unique to the Hereford world, and as it's transpired, it probably is, because... What we've managed to maintain and keep doing is different to what everyone else seems to be doing. Um, and providing we can get some satisfaction from doing it, and my son Tommy's quite keen that, you know, what we're doing is we'll carry on with for, for as long as we can. Um, you know, that that's fine. But it, it basically comes down to the genetic choice. We've got, uh, you know, a good mixture of of worldwide genetics now that are doing what we're wanting to do which as i say might be slightly different to a lot of people but some of it is due to our vision of looking forward the farm that we're involved with is organically registered and what we've got to do is produce an animal that can help and complement the management of that place um, um but also produce something from the resources that we have and um, so, uh, you know, we're not looking for extreme types in any direction. Um, and the old middle of the road, which is a damn dangerous place to be sometimes, may just be what we're looking at. <laughs> so just on some of those early 80s guys that, as I said, kept the, kept the fires burning, there would be great characters like... Uh, John Wayman Jones and Big Fred Harrington and Trevor Parker and, and they were a hierarchy but they they were resistant to change resistant to seeing the Charlie come in and taking over and uh, I suppose eventually finance sort of drove them out out of the the business or the next generations didn't carry on in the same way that you did but there was some when I first went into to livestock showing they there were some fantastic characters amongst them weren't there yeah well they, they were but you know with respect to them we might say a bit stuck in the mud because you can't you know you just cannot stand still and then i mean 
Um, for take the Charolais, for instance, and I remember it sort of coming in and, and, and well, when, you know, as things picked up and the breed was becoming more established. To be honest, I didn't think it would be half as successful as it was. You know, the Charolais did a fantastic thing. And, you know, we can argue with the fact that the Limousin has been even more so. And and like one of Boom, Boomer's favourite breeds in the British Blue. I mean, they are fantastic animals nowadays. And I mean, they're certainly different to what we saw when, when they were first imported. Sure. Um, and they've got a great contribution to make because um, the, the, the one of the greatest achievements of UK livestock breeding is the black Hereford suckler cow. Mm. But unfortunately, she can't be like that any longer. The Hereford's changed a little. The, the, the black and white dairy cow has changed a heck of a lot. And it needs bulls like the, the, the British Blue to, to help the dairy farmer get uh, maximum return from their beef crossing activities uh, just to get that extra and required muscle in. But the fact that the UK breeders have made such an outstanding job with the British Blue and made it much more uh, like the, the British tag isn't isn't like I remember John Fleming coming at me and t- advising me that this was the name of the breed. Now, well, I, I, you know, it, it's very fitting because it, 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 it's I've seen Belgian blues in Belgium, and I think they're certainly different to British blues in Britain. And I think uh, take your hats off to the people that have done it. But I don't mean to say that um, the triangle of the great breeds, uh, the Angus, the Beef Shorter, and the Hereford, they'll be coming back because um, again we can see things on the move very fast now and uh, perhaps the other breeds will be looking back at um, what the, what those three native breeds are up to. I'll move on to that in a second because Boomer has obviously a lot of information in that in his day job but we'll catch that in a second. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention really was the, the Americans there and I know uh, the great uh, Glenn Klippenstein who's been on our uh, podcast uh, takes some of the credit for bringing the the horned and the polled um, breeds together. And uh, in fact, we should mention uh, Glenn of, uh, of GK Farms, of course, is probably one of the top Hereford breeders over there. And uh, um, any other successful or, or any name, name dropping you want to do with these uh, with these um, uh, guys in Canada and, and the US, uh, both horned and, and uh, polled? Looking back in retrospect, one of the greatest happenings for UK Herefords happened in 1975 and what happened was a chap called Jonathan Fox from Just a Mere Farms in presumably Saskatchewan Canada yes, was invited yes. over to judge in during the month of September he, he started at the National Poll Show at Morton in the Marsh and then the following Saturday would be judging at Kington Show and it, it was the second Paul Hereford show that probably I ever attended, and it well, everybody was gobsmacked because what this chap was looking for was something completely different to the vast majority of breeders, even of British Paul Herefords, because he was looking for a, a good little bit longer body length, but the key thing was a much cleaner underline. Because this was the main problem that the native breeds had developed. They carried far too much waste in the brisket area. And like we've seen the old photographs, even through the, well, especially in the 1960s. I mean, uh, we got tremendous tops and iron quarters in cattle, but far too much waste through the belly line and in the brisket. And, and I think that was the key thing. So he judged the poll show and, well, like there were a lot of people a bit upset that they, have, they, they their animal had gone down the line a little bit. Um, and it was a cow that he made supreme champion, which was a, from bred at Crickley Barrow. Her name was Primrose. And she was like what you might call in them days a lightweight cow. I mean, you know, there, there wasn't a lot of strong structure about her, uh, not a lot of... Uh, great weight but she got this much cleaner line he actually made an imported canadian bull from the blanford family the male champion um and he was a big strong bull but the talk then during the next week was well kington will be a waste of time going to with this chap judging and uh, you you know no no point in turning up there and especially if you've got some fairly um 
uh, uh, well-bred horn cattle that you know that he probably wouldn't like. Well, as it transpired, it worked out quite well. Bob Carrington took the championship, and and looking back now at the pictures of him, he was a good block of a bull. But my father took the female championship with um with a two-year-old effort, and she was just a bit more growth and a little bit cleaner lined than, than than what some of her contemporaries. Um, but. Although it livened people up a lot, it did such a lot of good. And I still look back at that and all the criticism was made. Well, this is why you've got to be a little bit open minded in, in livestock breeding. And, and if to be successful, you've got to be looking about 10 years ahead all the time. It takes some doing. It's probably a bit more luck if you get there. But, you know, Jonathan Fox really pushed it home back in 1975 and I think we can be grateful that he did it. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's a good story and uh, obviously, as you said, that was a turning point for, sounds like, for both breeds and we fast forward now. Since then, there's been a lot of performance testing and massive increase in growth rates and genotyping and a lot of this would have been underpinned by the Hereford Cattle Society themselves, Clive. They've taken an active role in, in a lot of this this development, haven't they? I think they've got to, Andy. Um, um, I think we've got a big problem, really, in the UK that our sample base is a bit small. Um, and almost, like, with all of it, I mean, Texel sheep have got good numbers. I think when they're collecting data, it can go in to mean quite a lot. The Limousin certainly have quite managed it with the beef industry clearly the, the dairy industry is way ahead and because of the, but i think for a lot of um a lot of the minority beef breed and it includes some of our imported breeds now you know who just dropped off the numbers a little bit i mean getting meaningful information to put into these um programs that are designed to you know calculate uh, average based on big sample is very difficult really and therefore um i'll be interested in boomer's assessment of, of where we are with it but I, I i that's why i'm a little bit nervous of of overusing such information like ebbs um because i'd like to see you know greater numbers brought in and, and then you know greater ties in with all the genetics mixed together to come out with something more meaningful I mean, as we go forward now, genomics will uh, have a part to play. And I, d I think it'll be more difficult to argue with because, you know, what the DNA sample can give you, it, it, hopefully it, it's what is there. Mm. Um, you know, I think we have just got a bit of an issue. But the Hereford Society have always led the way with the performance data. They, they will be like the people like we mentioned, John Young, another fellow from in Herefordshire, Peter Fraser. They've been linked to North America through a lot of sales and purchases they made one way or the other. They were they were starting to weight record cattle in, in the mid late 1950s that developed into the performance test centers that the Hereford got involved with. They actually bought a small property south of Herefordshire, the society did, to which to conduct. Um, our, our own breed uh, performance that the MLC eventually took it on and all breeds were amassed there like like in other uh, centres mm. um, and now we've got into EBVs, we use ABRI, the Australian system which, which is really excellent and the, the parentage thing and you can go back generations and generations and the fact that we're used to the one we use and the Americans and the Canadians era for breeders use it too, I can get on there and have a good look back to the year dot really you know and i i mean i think all this is really valuable and great tools but it is a matter for modern day breeders to use all the tools and to try and do the best job with what they've got available well that's that's some um, wise words and it's nice to hear that the society are at the spearhead of a lot of this development and boomer this is probably where i reveal that uh, your your day job isn't a cattle breeder actual fact um uh, you're involved at the very sharp end of the the semen business and the, the particularly on the beef side so uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what you do boomer and maybe uh, a retort to what clive's just talked about with regards to, to figures so as you said andy as much as we'd like to be full-time at home it's uh yeah it doesn't pay the bills as much as, as the other job the other job does so i'm uh, full-time employed by um one of the uk's major semen companies cogent breeding um and I suppose my role within the company is um, beef genetics, um, which involves sire acquisition, any sort of projects 
um, involving beef genetics, uh, performance, um, commercially and both purebred and, and, and suckler beef. Um, and, over, and overseeing marketing and that type of thing is the business within beef. But predominantly, it's, it's genetic selection and genetic procurement um, across all breeds. Um, so all native beef breeds and, and continentals also. Mm-hmm. It puts you in a very powerful position, I suppose, to know who's buying what semen in various areas across various sectors and why. And, and uh, you've got a few figures there you can sort of back up where, where, the, where the Hereford sits and, and who sits where in, in, in the hierarchy here. Yeah, what would have been the, the, the dominant breeds sort of 11 years ago when I started with the company till, till now, um, within the dairy industry, and we, we all know the dairy beef industry is growing. HDB two years ago predicted 50% of the beef came from the dairy herd. I would think by the close of play this year, there's all sorts of figures being banded around. But you know, uh, we're looking at 60 to 62% of the UK beef coming from from the from the dairy herd. We've seen a mm-hmm. massive increase in usage of beef semen. Uh, within the dairy herd. Mm-hmm. That's due to the development through uh, sex semen and genomics with Holstein, like uh, Clive touched on. Um, and with that beef growth, um, it's been very much um, tailored to breeds that have, how do I say this, I suppose, breeds that have been market aware, been very aware that that dairy market is there. Um, it's a growing market and it's never gone away. And I suppose the Herefords are in a, in a prime position where you know, Hereford have always seen a market with uh, Hereford bull into dairy cows. Uh, and now we've seen it with semen growth. Uh, domestically, we sell a good number of Hereford. In terms of breed, it would sit probably number number three uh, in our domestic beef on dairy sales as a breed. Um, in front of that would be Angus and Blues, um, closely followed by Hereford. Um, Suckle beef industry would be predominantly um, dominated by Limousin again. Um, a breed that's up and coming fast uh, and very data driven is a stabiliser breed so you guys on the call would have been uh, been aware of this breed but the breed making a big movement in terms of data analysis and data recording um, and then followed by, by the limousine and the stabiliser there'll be a bit of Simmental and Hereford in that too mm-hmm. but they're in a really good position as a breed um, I suppose again what, what they're fo- focused on both horned and polled Hereford genetics is Short gestation, low birth weight and carbon ease, yeah. which obviously is at the forefront of any dairy farmer's mind. Sure, sure. Mm. Wise words, and, and as I said, it's great to have somebody on here that carries that experience. But well, let's go back to your, your first love, should I say, which is your sky-high uh, Hereford uh, herd there, um, Boomer. And you've got a production sale, I think, in the next couple of days, haven't you? And who, who are your customers these days? Are, you, are there still new breeders coming in to, to buy from you? And I'm right in thinking you might hold the, the recent female record, uh, do you, Boomer? Yeah, I'll touch wood, Andy. We, we, still, we, we, we sold a heifer in 2018, one of the first heifers we bred. Um, it was certainly a, a, a record uh, society sale for a female. Um, she, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Our customers would be predominantly um, suckler bred and pedigree enthusiasts. Um, the type of heritage we're probably breeding here are um, moderate framed, easy flash, uh, with confirmation, not too extreme, um, but again, with, with performance and carcass development in mind. Um, what I would say is we probably don't have it sky high. And we, as a, as a breeder, probably haven't focused on it, is, is the dairy industry. And I think um, one thing our counterparts across the water have um above us, and this isn't just probably the Herefords, this is all breeds, is there's a disjoint into what what probably is the correct commercial animal for commercial viability and a purebred. There's still a, there's still a, a distinguished uh, line between show cattle and, and pure cattle Absolutely. to a commercially based viable cattle. Um, and as we've seen, the US is all one type, all, all one sort, you know, peas in a pod, um, I don't think we, we're there, certainly in Europe and the UK yet, yeah, and, and there is a distinct, a definite line. But the type of cattle we're breeding here are probably uh, the suckler and pedigree enthusiasts in mind. The breeders that we've sold has us to uh, are predominantly um, new breeders, but with some established breeders looking to 
to get into certain female lines. Okay. And I, I, one of those new breeders, I believe, is a certain rugby referee uh, who's picked up with the breed now, Nigel Owens. And Nigel will be a good ambassador to have side. And I have an idea he's got a foot in both camps. Has he not got polled and, and horned cattle? Yeah, I met Nigel myself, actually, a, a few weeks back. Not on a, on a, a Sky Eye matter, on a, on a cogent matter, actually. We went in and had a look around the cows. Um, unfortunately, I haven't been lucky enough to sell, a, sell an animal to, to Nigel yet. But he, he's bought some very, very good cattle, um, both horned and polled. Uh, he's doing a great job for the breed on social media platforms. Uh, he's a great ambassador, like you say, for, for, for the breed. Um, and it, it's a real guy, who's obviously, in the public eye, and it's getting the, probably the the Hereford brand recognised mm. uh, on a different platform. Good. Great to bring those those people in. They've, they've got a lot more to give than just their fame, of course. And uh, and Clive, going back to you, uh, I think, I believe the Haven is uh, 200 years old. Is that next year, I think? And uh, some current breeds might be even older. And your own Westwood herd, they must go back a, a while. Though. When do you date back to? 1945, Father starting. He was a youngish chap, you know, like it's like seeing Bo- B- um, Boomer and Millie uh, working away. Well, like my father was, uh, you know, in his 20s, and uh, st- his uncle, who was, who was an established breeder, gave him encouragement much more than his uh, my grandfather gave father because he, he thought it was a complete waste of time. But I'm glad Dad stuck it out because uh, we've had some tremendous times with the breed, Andy. And looking back, at, you know, I mean, like the, the shows that we attended, the great sales that we witnessed, you know. And um, I mean, the year that I left school in the mid seventies, father sold three bulls quite genuinely at auction on what he called a bad trade, and would have bought three Land Rovers with the money and. And and like the fact that he was disappointed with that, like just shows the sort of uh, times that uh, that a herd, although come into some prominence, you know, wasn't the top herd in, in in the outfit. Like and and people could do business like that then. Um, I think we've bred a lot better cattle since. Sadly, we just can't get the value out of them. But uh, you know, I, I, it's uh, stock breeding, such a long-term job, um, and and we've got to stick at it and get through every challenge. And you must admire the people that have achieved that. Yeah. And like you say, the the world's oldest herd is the lean herd, founded in 1780 originally by the Turner family, now owned by the Norman family. Sort of been a herd that stayed on the same farm with different owners but that's fine um but the haven is certainly you know one of the great flagships of the breed as far as i'm concerned it was the herd that sort of set and father going on the right track with buying a succession of bulls from there we've probably had a dozen from there over all the years um and and as you say andy founded in 1822 by thomas Lewis, and then it, and then his nephew bought cattle at his sale when he went to the Haven farm, um, and, and and it's been going on now well into the you know the fourth generation of, of the family, five generations in all. Yeah, you really must admire you know what they've achieved. Not their their own exports are must be like a, a world record of any mm. beef breeding herd because I mean hundreds and hundreds have gone to all the corners of the world and I've got such a lot of admiration for them and young Ben Lewis now is, is certainly as keen as anybody and uh, isn't that great news. That's excellent and as you said an institution and to, to see the youngsters going in there one day we'll probably see maybe Ben going up against Boomer here in, in uh, yeah. Clive we've done over the two episodes we've done nearly 300 years of history condensed into a couple of hours and it's been interesting and fun and I hope informative and probably the one question I will ask and uh, I'll ask you both in turn really which is the most dominant now the polled or the horned uh, Boomer I'll let you go the, from from where I stand and the, 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 for, for me the most dominant definitely is the polls and um, I think it's probably in terms of poll genetics other than Angus um, it's got the whole poll scenario nailed down to a tier of the breed now Whereas your, your Continentals and your, your Limbers and your Simmentals are really dipping into the pole side mm-hmm. of things now, along with all the other Continental breeds. Yeah. Herefords are certainly at the forefront and they're doing a really good job, not just domestically, but internationally as well. And numbers-wise, I suppose, is what I was after, Clive. What, what, what the registrations would be for, from uh, horn to pole? Would they be 50-50 or, or who's got the numbers? Oh, no, 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 Andy. There's far more Paul Arafords registered here in the UK. I don't really know what the figures are, but I would say it's virtually 
three quarters to a quarter in favour of the poll error, but and possibly throughout the world, Andy. But as I say, I, I think there's still some important genetics knocking around the the horn section. And I mean, one that one that you can point your finger at, which has been a tremendous success for for the Hereford breed, is the Line One project, which is an American thing. It 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 stems from that Prince Domino bull that, that um, we spoke about. I think it was a great grandson of his. Two great grandsons of his were chosen to start this research project, which was basically a beef research project. Hereford was chosen to do it. They developed 10 lines in all, but the only one that survived after the mid-1970s, and this was in the 1930s that this thing started, was what they called line one. And like, like such a lot of orange genetics go back to those bloodlines. And the fact that it was a very inbred... Actually, Boomer mentioned the stabilizer, which is, a, which is an outfit that, that impresses me such a lot. I think the blueprint for stabilizer cattle is excellent. You know, the, the, the type, the frame of them, the, the weight gains, the, the sort of marketing element of it, the uniformity that it brings. But personally, I prefer to... to to produce the goods in a crossbreeding program because I think I bred vigor would help me a bit more. Okay. Well, the stabilizer developed by Leachman mm. will have been almost computer generated yep. as far as its makeup goes and, and, and the connections with the, with, with the genetics within it. This thing was done with a bit of pen and paper by somebody. And if you study the, all the detail of the numbers that are involved in setting up a, a project so it doesn't become too inbred, they're not, not far then away from one another. So I, I think hats off the people who developed a line one at uh, Fort Keogh range out there in, in America. Um, because what they still offer us today are some wonderful genetics. We've used them in, if you like, a, a, a genetic crossing program with, with other outside genetics. People like John Douglas up at Stranra have actually got a full herd now of American line one cattle here in the UK. And he's got a great following with them. And, and I think that's an illustration uh, of what sound uh, horned for genetics can do. I just would like to finish off really as we tend to on these uh, history programs just pay homage to some of the the more recent breeders who were in and amongst the breed and I think we've probably covered the biggest part of the of the of the horn side of it but Boomer just uh, there's still as well as yourself there's some damn good uh, good herds of polled Herefords around about the country so just list a couple of, a couple more of them please. Yeah some of the guys who probably have been influential in what we've done and what I've seen and learned from would be you know your the Wilson family from Cowbog at Romany, uh, fantastic herd of cows and, and been very, very influential within the breed. Um, the Joneses, um, obviously Wales, Dender, Dennis, yeah. unbelievable herd of cattle. Um, yeah, and, and, and always I remember Dennis from running around the, the, the Royal Shows back in the 2000s, you know. Um, and then there'd be the Timmises at Sheridan at Bass Church, another great herd of cows that have been influential, done a really good job. Um, and obviously the lives is at uh, Normanton over in Leicester. I heard of cattle and, and, and those guys, what they did with their bull uh, over the last couple of years in interbreed and, and interbreed titles at the big national shows. Yeah, guys that are doing a really good job and, and influential in pushing the breed forward, I would Superb. say. Superb. And we did, one we probably missed is uh, John Cameron, of course, at Balboothy. And I heard that John's not so well just now, which is uh, but a man who's been there and, and been a great stalwart for the, for the breed, hasn't he? Yeah, 100%, mm. without a doubt. Um, and, and again, a great herd. I remember... Uh, my father going on a, on a herd visit up there with uh, Jim Barber and, and coming back and absolutely raving about the quality of stock. And we're going back a few years ago now, but just mm -hmm. raving about the quality of cattle and, and what an every cow it was. Mm -hmm. Great. I've had enough of your time, chaps. We've run well over the hour there, and uh, we've got a lot of people to well, want to go and get their, their tea as well as us going to get ours. Clive, I've really enjoyed the two or three hours I've had with you. And Boomer, you've brought a. As Clive said, a, a bit of energy and a different dynamic to this uh, this conversation, and uh, I think you guys bounced off each other well here. So uh, thanks very much for what you brought to us. Perfect. Thank, Thank you very, you much, very much. much. Okay. Thank you, Clive. All, all the best to you all. Yeah. Cheers, gentlemen. Cheers. Thank you for listening to this week's podcast, which was kindly sponsored by Harbro, suppliers of quality commercial and pedigree feeds and expert nutritional advice. Visit their website or find them on Facebook for more information. 
And while on the subject of Facebook, why don't you visit the Top Lines and Tales Facebook page where you'll find photographs and more information to back up this episode.